Hello everyone. The Coordinating Center for the National Drug Early Warning System, which is sponsored by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, welcomes you to our sixth NDUCE Presents webinar. The NDUCE PI is Dr. Eric Wish, and our NIDA project scientist is Moira O'Brien. My name is Erin Johnny, and Marwa Al-Nazir and I will be the facilitators for this webinar. We are a part of the NDUCE Coordinating Center team. For those who are interested, you can find information about NDUs, recordings of prior webinars, and invitations to future webinars on our website at www.ndus.org. You will also find instructions for how to join our NDUs network and participate in ongoing discussions with more than 1,200 experts and concerned citizens from about 20 different countries. So I certainly hope if you haven't joined the network, you will join us there and we'll be able to continue many of the conversations that we start today during our webinar. We developed NDUS Presents webinars to work with leading substance abuse experts to explore emerging drugs and timely drug-related topics. This month, today, we are highlighting selected findings for heroin, fentanyl, and methamphetamine from the NDUS Sentinel Site Advance Report and the NDUS 2016 Sentinel Community Site Drug Trends Reports. Each of our 12 Sentinel Community Site epidemiologists has prepared a report on drug trends in their area. And this afternoon, we're very fortunate to be joined by four of them who will review what they've been seeing in regards to these three drugs in their area. We have Dr. Marcella Sorg, a research professor at the University of Maine, Margaret Chase Smith Policy Center, James N. Hall, drug epidemiologist at the Nova Southeastern University Center for Applied Research on Substance Use and Health Disparities, Dr. Jane Maxwell, research professor at the University of Texas at Austin, and Dr. Philip Coffin, director of substance abuse research at the San Francisco Department of Public Health. This webinar is expected to run approximately 120 minutes, and we encourage you to submit questions during and after the presentations. Please just post your questions in the Q&A box that you'll see on your screen, and we will get to them. Some of them I may be able to answer as we're going along, and some of them will hold until all the presentations are complete when we'll run through the questions that we have received at that time and give our panelists an opportunity to respond to them. Our panelists, Marwell and I, will do our best to get to all of your questions, but we will also post a transcript of the Q&A with the responses to all the questions submitted on our website, nduce.org. And you also should keep in mind that you can adjust your screen so you can make our faces smaller or make them go away completely if you want and, and adjust what you're seeing on the screen. So certainly take the time to do that. And we thank you for joining us and hope that you enjoy the webinar. And so to start us off, I'm going to share some highlights with you from the advanced report that I just mentioned. And again, you will be able to find that on our website. And so give me a minute to switch over to that screen. Here we go, and now launch it. So just to give you a quick overview of NDUs, in case there are a few folks who joined us today who don't know much about us, we are funded, as I said, by NIDA and NIH as a National Public Health Surveillance System. It's about a five-year program that was designed to generate quick critically needed information about drugs and their public health consequences. And we do this with a, a variety of different kinds of approaches. And the particular one that we'll be looking at today is our Sentinel Community Sites. And so as a part of the Sentinel Community Sites, we have developed collaborations with experts in 12 different parts of the country. And you can see that they vary in size and that they represent all of the regions in the United States. These sites also had been a part of the, the predecessor program that had been run by NIDA called the Community Epidemiology Work Group. And for complete information about the contacts for each of these sites, you can find that on our website as well. And so this is the advanced report itself. And basically what we did was we reviewed all 12 of the reports and looked for selected findings that we thought were important to, to share with all of you about heroin, fentanyl, and methamphetamine. And we focused on three primary types of data indicators. So we looked at treatment admissions, where the primary substance of abuse was one of these drugs. We looked at drug-involved deaths that involved one of these three drugs. And we also looked at 
data that we get from the DEA, from the Drug Enforcement Administration, from their National Forensic Laboratory Information System, which is a place that houses toxicology results for items that are seized by law enforcement. And, and so we get reports for the items that have been analyzed and submitted to the NIFLA system for our sites. And so I just was gonna share a couple of things, key points with you for each of these three drugs and then show you a couple examples of some of the graphics that we're, we're working on now for this information. And so starting here with heroin, we saw in looking across our reports that heroin indicators are climbing in most if not all of our sites, but that there were some regional differences that we uncovered. So for example, the six Eastern and new sites for which complete data was available and Texas reported that in 2015, heroin involved deaths reached the highest point since at least 2011. And you'll see that several of the sites who are presenting this afternoon are, are in this list. So you'll be able to hear more about this from them when they speak. And in six NDU sites, more than 30% of treatment admissions had a primary drug of abuse of heroin. And in fact, the FCEs in Maine, Southeastern Florida and King County, the Seattle area, reported that the percentage of admissions that were heroin related has more than doubled since 2011. Taking a quick look at fentanyl, we can say now that fentanyl has been found in all 12 of our sentinel sites, but that fentanyl related overdose deaths increased predominantly in our eastern sites. So six sites east of the Mississippi reported increases in overdose deaths related to fentanyl in 2015. And in looking at the DEA National Forensic Laboratory Information System results, we saw that fentanyl reports are rare but increasing. And in 2015, fentanyl reports have now been recorded in all 12 of our sentinel sites. And the number of fentanyl reports identified from items submitted by law enforcement agencies doubled or more from 2014 to 2015 in all but two of our sites. And in total, as of the end of 2015, five fentanyls had been found in our end use sites. And we expect, based on a lot of news reports and the, the overdoses that we've all, I'm sure, read about in recent months, that there may be some additional types of fentanyl or fentanyl related substances found in the coming year. Looking at methamphetamine, we did find also a di distinction here between our eastern sites and our western sites. More than 10% of people entering drug treatment in 2015 in all five western NDU sites reported methamphetamine as their primary substance of abuse. And in fact, methamphetamine ranked in the top four primary substances reported in all five of our western sites. In contrast, less than 1% of treatment emissions in six of the NDU sites east of the Mississippi mentioned methamphetamine as their primary substance of abuse in 2015. The exception was Atlanta Metro, which is an interesting case. And I'm sure if Dr. Brian Dew were speaking with us this afternoon, he would, he would be pointing that out to you and how uh, Atlanta shows up as, as higher than other Eastern sites in a number of our indicators. And lastly, again, in looking at the DEA NIFLIS data, that showed that in 2015, methamphetamine was one of the top three drugs identified by law enforcement in all five NDU sites west of the Mississippi River. So I wanna show you now a couple of the graphics that we've started working on, because we've been working with Dr. Kathleen Stort and her staff in the Department of Geographical Sciences here at the University of Maryland to look for new and improved ways that we can start to highlight these data and, and show the different regional differences. And so these are a couple of things she set up for us. This one looks at the percentage of heroin or methamphetamine drug reports of all analyzed drug reports submitted to DEA NIFLIS in 2015. And what you see here is heroin is the green bars and methamphetamine is the orange bars. So what you'll notice is you see green bars here in the, in the east, but you only see a little asterisk where methamphetamine would be. And that's because less than 2% of reports in those sites were methamphetamine reports, as opposed to some of these sites out west where you see a much larger orange bar where, where more than 30% of reports were methamphetamine reports. And lastly, I have this map here, which is a way of looking at treatment admissions in 2015. And this one shows 
that people entering drug treatment in Western ND sites were more likely to report methamphetamine as the primary substance of abuse than those in the East. And so the larger the circle, the higher the percentage of total admissions reporting methamphetamine as the primary substance of abuse. So again, you see the smallest circles are up here and the larger circles are in this area here. So for additional information, again, I encourage you to go to our website. You'll see information uh, that we have posted there about a lot of these drugs. You'll see our advanced report. You'll see some of the other kinds of reports we've done, like our special report on fentanyl, for example, at endus.org. You can also send us an email if you have any questions or comments or want additional information about anything I talked about today at endus at umd.edu. And you can also follow us on Twitter. We do have a, a Twitter account now, and News News. So I hope that you will join us there and on the network to continue our, our conversation. And so I'm going to switch over to our panelists now. Um, we have four of our end News SCEs coming up. And our first panelist is Dr. Marcella Sorg. And Dr. Sorg is going to talk about illicit opioid and methamphetamine trends in Maine. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that she can share hers. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me all right. Um, I'm going to be talking about methamphetamine and illicit opioid problems in Maine. And the objectives today are to provide an overview of the crisis in Maine with illicit opioids. And I'll be focusing on heroin and non-pharmaceutical fentanyl. Um, I'm also going to be updating uh, the methamphetamine abuse indicators. Uh, methamphetamine production in small labs has spiked in Maine and the increased use is reflected in some of the treatment numbers. The population in Maine is very rural compared to other states. We have uh, only 1.3 million people spread over 35,000 uh, square miles. And we're 95% white with the oldest median age in the country. I'm gonna start with um, the uh, the graph uh, for overdoses and I'd like to uh, draw your attention to the blue line. Um, Maine has a statewide medical examiner system which means that the uh, centralized source for overdose data. Uh, this graph shows the total number of overdoses in the state increasing from 34 in 1997 to 272 in 2015. Those numbers are continuing to rise. Based on the first half of 2016, the total for 2016 is projected to be about 40% higher than the 2015 total. It'll be about 380. As in many states, the problem in Maine began with pharmaceutical opioids. The red line, uh, it began to spike in 2002 related to OxyContin related overdoses. The illicit drug category, the green line, was mainly heroin and cocaine early on. But in 2012, this category also includes non-pharmaceutical fentanyl. Illicit drugs, and that's the green line, decreased substantially during the period, uh, especially during 2008 to 11, and then began a steep increase. And this is due to a surge in heroin and the addition of fentanyl and its analogs. Pharmaceutical opioid-induced deaths, meanwhile, have essentially remained at a plateau since 2002. We had a slight decline in 2010 to 12 as medical sources were better controlled through prescription monitoring and provider education. But this category too has begun to creep slightly upward due mainly to drug trafficking sources coming from out of state. This graph focuses on the time period from 2010 on divided in, oh, sorry, I have to advance it here, uh, divided into half years. 
it shows the contribution of heroin and non-pharmaceutical fentanyl to the death patterns. The blue line shows the total number of overdoses for comparison. The red line is the heroin deaths and the green is fentanyl. Our approach with these drug categories is to count as suspected heroin all deaths in which the death certificate mentions either heroin or morphine after we remove any deaths no, uh, due to known pharmaceutical morphine. We take a similar approach in tallying suspected non-pharmaceutical fentanyl. That is, we remove all cases due to known pharmaceutical sources of fentanyl. This does not eliminate all cases of diverted pharmaceutical fentanyl. Although we do check case notes and we remove any cases in which a fentanyl patch was found on the body. Looking at the red heroin line, you will see that it began to increase uh, in the first half of 2012, whereas suspected non-pharmaceutical began to really increase two years later in the first half of 2014. And during the first half of this year, the number of cases due to non-pharmaceutical fentanyl and its analogs actually exceeded the heroin deaths. And you can see that at the end of the slide here. The upsurge in heroin and fentanyl is a northern New England pattern. Uh, the same sort of thing is happening in uh, New Hampshire and Vermont. Uh, this slide shows the relationship between just the heroin, this time in blue, and the non-pharmaceutical fentanyl in red over the last six years, shown again in half-year increments. The green color shows the number of cases where heroin and fentanyl were found together as co-intoxicants. Both were listed as a cause of death. The earliest incidents of heroin-fentanyl combinations it occurred in the second half of 2013. And by the first half of 2016, these comprise 21% of the opioid combination deaths. In January to June 2016, deaths due to fentanyl and its chemical analogs, either alone or in combination with other drugs, actually comprise 44% of Maine's drug deaths, 85 out of 188. The vast majority, 80%, of overdoses have two or more drugs listed on the death certificate as a cause of death. As you can see in this comparison here, both heroin and fentanyl deaths include a pharmaceutical opioid as a co-intoxicant about a fifth to a quarter of the time. Heroin deaths include fentanyl as a co-intoxicant nearly half the time, 46%, but fentanyl includes heroin only a quarter of the time about 26%. Both heroin and fentanyl deaths are combined with cocaine fairly frequently, heroin slightly more often uh, than with fentanyl. We examined the decedents whose cause of death was heroin to see if they had a history of prescription opioid medications. In this 2015 sample, we examined 107 heroin deaths. 88 had a known prescription history. Not all had a medical record. Of the 88, 17% had a, a pharmaceutical opioid prescription within the previous month. 60% had opioid prescription within the previous year. And all had 100% uh, had a history of substance abuse uh, 38% had a history of heroin abuse specifically, and that's according to either family or to medical records. Although there is a relationship between addiction and pharmaceutical opioids, uh, heroin addiction and pharmaceutical opioids, uh, there are clear differences in both age and sex patterns among the decedents. And uh, I've listed just the percent male in this slide, 
a fentanyl deaths, 80% male, heroin, 74%, and pharmaceutical opioids, uh, much less, only 55% male, uh, much more equal distribution. This graph compares mean ages by sex among decedents whose cause of death is pharmaceutical opioid versus heroin or fentanyl. And males tend to be slightly younger in all three drug categories. But the real difference uh, is that those who die due to pharmaceutical opioids tend to be older than those who die due to heroin or illicit fentanyl. The is six to eight years younger for heroin or fentanyl deaths than it is for pharmaceutical opioid deaths, and the average female age is seven to nine years younger. I should mention here that the population of overdose deaths tends to be older than the general population. Those who are older tend to have other medical problems, which makes them more vulnerable to dying from an overdose. It's not just the average age of death that is older, it's the whole population of drug deaths as shown in this graph. Here the sexes are combined to illustrate differences in the age distributions among decedents in 2015 and 16. Rather than use, using the usual bar graph to display the age categories, I'm displaying it as lines so it's easier to see the differences between the drug categories across the age categories. The fentanyl deaths is the orange line, and you can see that it is the youngest, skewed to the left the furthest, a little younger than the heroin deaths, which is the red line, and you can see the slight skew to the right here. The pharmaceutical opioids are the oldest of the three, and it, that whole distribution is pushed to the right uh, over top of the age groups 40s, 50s, and 60s. As with the deaths, the urine toxicology screens of impaired drivers are a leading indicator of trends in, uh, by drug category. This graph shows three illicit drug categories, cocaine, heroin, and pharmaceutical opioids trending over the past six years. Observe the sharp increase in cocaine in 2015 and the more gradual increase in heroin since 2012, which mirrors the death uh, statistics. Pharmaceutical opioids, however, have been quite stable, uh, 57 to 60 over this time period, and then they have dipped in 2015 down to 48%. I'm switching now to talk to you about treatment admissions. Uh, and. The statewide statistics for substance abuse disorder treatment for Maine shows a pattern similar to the deaths and impaired drivers in terms of the rise in heroin problems. Heroin admissions, which is the blue line, has kind of gradually increased from 7% in 2010 to 22% in 2014 and 27% in 2015, ultimately overtaking the totals for primary admissions for pharmaceutical opioids. Currently, the main database does not discriminate pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical fentanyl admissions, so the fentanyls are all included in the, in the opiates. Unlike the age distribution among decedents, which were substantially different, younger for heroin and older for opioids, the age distribution for these two categories among primary admissions is much more similar. Heroin clients are still, however, slightly younger. Now you can see that in this comparison uh, bar graph. There are some gender differences, but these are less than for the deaths. The mean male age for heroin admissions is 34, 
and for pharmaceutical opioids is 35, almost the same. The mean female age is 31 for heroin and 34 for pharmaceutical opioid admissions. And in the slide, you can see it displayed across all of the decile uh, age categories. And uh, the blue is the heroin and the red is the pharmaceutical opioids. Trends for statewide law enforcement seizures for heroin, fentanyl, and pharmaceutical opioids generally follows the trend seen in other indicators with a sharp and continuing rise in heroin items beginning in 2013. Seen here is the blue line uh, and the rise in fentanyl beginning in 2014. And uh, I think you can see that here. The illicit fentanyl is the red line here and there's the beginning of the rise and heroin's a little bit earlier. This is coupled uh, by a more gradual decline in pharmaceutical opioid items in 2015, right here. The lab results in this graph are reflected in the federal NIFLIS reports. Fentanyl was identified in 11% of the 1300 NIFLIS reports from drug items tested by law enforcement higher than any of the other Endu Sentinel sites. In this slide, I'm tracking the uh, appearance of the fentanyl analogs. Uh, you can see fentanyl in the deaths is seen for the first time in 2015. We had 33 of them and in 2016, the first half, we've already got 18. Uh, amongst seizures, law enforcement seizures, uh, there were two in 2014 and 43 in 2015. I don't have uh, 2016 data yet. The rest of these analogs, uh, furanyl fentanyl, dyspropionyl fentanyl, and fluoral fentanyl, uh, are found occasionally in the main deaths. Uh, you can see these occur just in 2016 in the first half. Uh, I put NA here because they're not testing, uh, at least screening for these uh, fentanyl analogs. It's taking labs a while to uh, get um, uh, the ability uh, to, to screen for these uh, analogs. We also have had two cases of non-pharmaceutical opioid U47700. I've got just a few slides about fentanyl uh, trends. Treatment admissions numbered only 47 in 2015 and showed no clear trend in the numbers since 2010. But the reported route of administration has changed dramatically as we see in this slide. The, uh, the dramatic change in this route of administration for 4% who report smoking in 2014 to 53% in 2015. You can see the highlighted, this, it's this purple line here. Uh, smoking is 53% uh, last year. Keeping in mind the small population that we're dealing with in this graph, this change is probably not as significant as it appears. However, the increase is reflective of a similar very dramatic increase in this number of small labs statewide in the state of Maine as seen in this slide. This rather dramatic change right here, uh, methamphetamine administration from 4% uh, Oh, sorry, I forgot to advance here. The incidence of methamphetamine small lab incidents has been rising sharply, going from one, only one in 2009, to 28 in 2014, 56 in 2015. And as of this week, the uh, 2016 number is already 102. Uh, these are small labs in cars and homes. The responses to these labs due to hazardous materials used are creating resource issues for the main drug enforcement agency 
and well-known dangers to children and neighbors of the apartments and homes where they occur. This is my last slide, a summary. In 2015, heroin was responsible for 39% of our deaths. We found them in 26% of impaired driver toxicology tests. They were implicated in 39% of MDEA arrests, 42% of law enforcement seizures, and 26% of primary admissions. Fentanyl and its analogs constituted 32% of the deaths and was found in 11% of law enforcement seizure items. Methamphetamine small labs have increased dramatically in the last two years, along with an upsurge in smoking as a route of administration <clears throat> among primary treatment admissions. Other indicators are low. These drug categories have been responsible for an unprecedented pressure on Maine's population, on our medical examiner system as well, and on systems throughout New England, as well as our law enforcement communities and our public health programs. The fiscal resources for these agencies have not been able to keep up with demands these drugs create in public safety and public health responses. Thank you, and I'll pass it back to you, Erin. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Sorg. We really appreciate your presentation and all that information that you shared with us on the overdose deaths in your area and that striking graphic you had on the small lab incidents with methamphetamine. And we're gonna move on now to southeastern Florida where Mr. Hall is going to fill us in on emerging trends in opiates and methamphetamine in the three counties in his area. Yes, and good afternoon. This is going to be an overview of the opiate and methamphetamine emerging drug trends in the three southeastern Florida counties of Palm Beach, Broward, and Miami-Dade. Uh, together, these th three counties have a total population of six million people. Uh, which is a portion of the 20 million uh, population statewide. I'm using the term opiates to include heroin as well as prescription opioids and illicitly manufactured opioid analogs from generally foreign clandestine labs. Let's see. Florida has historically had really relatively low heroin incidences. However, this graph shows the escalation of heroin deaths uh, since uh, 2012, with an estimated 686 heroin-related deaths in the state of Florida uh, in 2015. Uh, of that number, 291 were in the three southeastern Florida counties. And we also see the declining number of heroin deaths in the first decade of this new century. Uh, and then in both the region as well as across the state, uh, a significant rise uh, since uh, 2012 in the number of heroin related deaths. Among the 2015 statewide deaths, 93% were considered the cause of death by a local medical examiner. And 95% of the cases had another drug present. Of the 2015 Southeast Florida cases, they represented 42% of the state's total in the area with 30% of the state's population. But our opiate epidemic also includes prescription opioids. And this graph shows the number of prescription opioid lethal considered cause of death occurrences uh, in the state dramatically rising from 2000 to 2010, as Florida was notorious for its pill mill distribution, its lack of having a prescription drug monitoring program, and wide scale uh, diversion of prescription opioids. Uh, that declined beginning in 2011 with a crackdown on pill mills and the establishment of the prescription drug monitoring program for the state. Not included in these prescription opioids are also now the morphine deaths. 
and they've been separated out because they've been increasing in the last three reporting years, uh, largely because um, many of these may actually be heroin deaths, and that heroin rapidly metabolizes to six monoacetic morphine uh, in the decedent, and then within an hour, uh, just to morphine. So uh, many medical examiner occurrences may actually be heroin cases that are reported as morphine. And then the other is the uh, rise of fentanyl-related uh, uh, deaths particularly in the 2014 and 2015 period. Uh, prior to that, most of the uh, fentanyl deaths were believed to be pharmaceutical fentanyl. However, in the last two years, the increase has been attributed to uh, illicitly manufactured fentanyl analogs. And most uh, medical examiner uh, toxicology reports do not differentiate in Florida between being a pharmaceutical or a non-pharmaceutical fentanyl. And then added to the total are the rise in heroin deaths as shown in the black portion of the bar. For a total in 2015 of 3,529 opiate deaths in the state of Florida. And approximately half of those are with a prescription opioid and the other half related to heroin or a product sold as heroin or a product that has been analyzed and identified in decedents as morphine. We also track the number of hospital cases for non-fatal prescription opioid poisons. And the most current reporting year is just through 2014, but we see that that is the largest number since they began tracking this in 2007. The red portion of the bar graph are those emergency department cases, and the blue portion is for those that were admitted as inpatients. Um, and in addition to these nearly 1,000 prescription opioid non-fatal hospital cases per month in Florida. There were also in 2014, 1,925 hospital heroin poisons, most of which were also non-fatal episodes reversed by um, administration of naloxone. It is, however, interesting to note that 29% of the heroin cases and only 7% of the prescription opioid cases also had a co-diagnosis of substance abuse or dependency. And 71% of the heroin cases and more than 90% of the prescription opioid patients, patients did not have uh, such a diagnosis, uh, indicating uh, in many cases that more than half of these patients were simply discharged to their own self-care or to home. And this uh, showing the really missed opportunity of intervention services at the hospital, whether in the emergency department or within patients, to get them to counseling and hopefully into treatment and recovery services. In our three southeastern Florida counties, in Miami-Dade, there were 1,450 opiate overdoses now estimated in the year 2015, including 478 fatalities and 972 non-fatal opiate overdoses. In neighboring Broward County, we see the same proportion with 367 fatal overdoses in 2015 and 732 non-fatal uh, opiate overdoses. And a similar pattern in Palm Beach County with 412 estimated deaths and 818 non-fatal episodes. That gives us a total of 3,779 overdoses, including 1,257 deaths. These are actually conservative estimates since they are only estimates and not based on finalized reports. However, we do have the final figures from each of the medical examiner departments, but we do not have the hospital uh, non-fatal overdose cases uh, precisely measured. But in all, these overdoses averaged an overdose every two hours and 18 minutes in the three southeastern Florida counties, or 10.4 per day in 2015, and including an opiate death every seven hours, or 3.4 per day every day around the clock. 
Our medical examiners in the three southeastern Florida counties all report escalating numbers in 2016 as compared to the previous year, particularly for fentanyl uh, overdose deaths. And we've already equaled the number that we had in the full calendar year in 2015 in each of the three counties and have surpassed it in two. A 2016 phenomena has been the arrival of counterfeit medications containing illicitly manufactured uh, fentanyl analogs. In January, we had nine deaths from counterfeit Xanax pills, uh, which uh, contained uh, fentanyl. There have also been many more cases of oxycodone counterfeit, as well as other prescription opiate counterfeits, all containing illicit non-pharmaceutical uh, fentanyl. This is a phenomena that our research center at Nova Southeastern University has identified in at least 10 states across the nation and uh, is often not separated from medical examiner reports of whether this was fentanyl discovered as a heroin adulterant or substitute or whether it was actually a counterfeit pill. Indeed, what we have with our opiate epidemic of addiction and deaths is the perfect narcotic storm. Whether users begin as legitimate patients receiving prescriptions for uh, accidents or chronic pain, um, or uh, substance abusers uh, turning to prescription opioids um, from pill mills or doctor shopping or the illicit street market. As individuals continue to use the opioids, they develop tolerance, therefore needing more and moving into full-fledged addiction. Characterized by the classic dope sick withdrawal syndrome related to opiates, a syndrome which is not only the severe nausea flu-like symptoms, but many other distressing as well as pharmaceutical uh, or neuropharmaceutical uh, anxiety, which adds to the distress uh, and the addiction of uh, opiate dependency. Also adding to the perfect storm has been the arrival of plentiful amounts of Mexican heroin, whereas not as potent as traditional South American heroin seen in Florida, the Mexican heroin has been fortified with fentanyl analogs as well as other illicitly manufactured opioids. Another key factor in this current 21st century opiate epidemic is the widespread polysubstance abuse linked with either heroin or prescription opioids. Most all of the opiate deaths in Florida also have at least one benzodiazepine on board, and generally that's alprazolam. But as in Maine, we are also seeing a rise in cocaine in combination with heroin or a prescription opioid, as well as marijuana, alcohol, or whatever other drug. So polysubstance abuse patterns are fueling the uh, particularly fatal episodes of uh, opiate uh, overdoses. And added to all of this is the 2016 phenomena now of counterfeit pills, as well as individuals released from jails or prison or who have been involved in a short-term treatment program and in abstinence will often relapse, and when they do, following that several weeks or more of abstinence from an opioid, have a much lower tolerance and therefore are overdosing and dying. Many of our deaths in Palm Beach County are in so-called sober homes or in cheap motels where individuals go following uh, release from treatment programs or jail uh, and attempting to be sober, but where relapse occurs. Altogether, this makes the epidemic of addiction and deaths in Florida, as it's also related very much to a pandemic uh, across the nation. Turning to methamphetamine in Florida, we see vast regional differences in the occurrence of methamphetamine which is reported at much lower levels than we'll see in our western states. But in Florida, the Tampa Bay area had more than double the number of 
crime lab cases as reported by the National Forensic Laboratory System in the blue parts of the bar graph for 2015 and the red portion for just the first six months of 2016. The Tampa Bay area was followed by Orlando and then Panama City in the northern panhandle of Florida and Fort Myers area on the west coast with Pensacola back in the northern panhandle, uh, Gainesville in central Florida. And it's not until we get down to 219 combined cases for the 18th month period that Broward County and 204 in Miami-Dade and only 42 in Palm Beach County that we see uh, methamphetamine involved in crime lab activity um, for the south, three southeastern Florida counties. This is a wide diversion uh, or, or divergence of the uh, methamphetamine availability in the state. Most all of the methamphetamine is believed to come from Mexican sources and the connection with the Atlanta, Georgia area, which has really become the East Coast distribution point, may also be seen in these geographic patterns of the distribution uh, in Florida. Nonetheless, we have seen a continuing rise in the number of methamphetamine-related deaths statewide uh, from 2011 through 2015. Uh, this data is report, are reported, these data are reported only uh, statewide and we don't have the geographical breakdown as yet, but we are, are seeking to see if that also follows the other trends we're seeing with methamphetamine. And finally, there's a sharp difference in the percent of methamphetamine primary treatment admissions as a proportion of all admissions, including alcohol, in the different regions of the state. In Northwest Florida, uh, in the Northern Panhandle, nearly 10% of all treatment admissions are for methamphetamine as a primary treatment uh, category. Compared to just half of that in West Coast of Florida um, with 4.5%, and then in the Jacksonville area in the Northeast portion of the state, just 2.5%, as compared to a little over 1% in central Florida and less than 1% at 0.8 uh, in southeast Florida. The rate for the entire state is 3.5% of all treatment admissions. In summary, we are seeing in the three southeastern Florida counties an estimated 10 opiate overdoses per day in 2015 and an estimated three and a half opiate deaths per day in just the three counties. And that was for 2015. We well expect these numbers to dramatically increase and perhaps even double by uh, the end of 2016. And that increase is primarily fueled by escalating illicitly manufactured fentanyl and other opiate analogs coming from clandestine labs in China or perhaps Mexico. We've seen uh, at least four different fentanyl analogs identified in Florida, as well as U47700 related to several of the recent deaths and with several pending cases believed to be car fentanyl. So the new drugs just continue to appear. And finally, the 2016 phenomena of the arrival of counter pill, counterfeit pills, uh, even as benzodiazepine fake Xanax tablets, uh, expand the risk of the epidemic. And looking at methamphetamine, we see the highest crime and treatment rates in northern and western Florida as compared to the three southeastern Florida counties. However, deaths are in the increase, and most recently, just in the last week, We've had uh, in Southeast Florida, several deaths reported to a poisonous unknown product sold as methamphetamine, but which has not yet been identified. However, that remains it's only anecdotal and we're waiting for laboratory and medical examiner toxicology reports to further uh, explore that topic. I thank you for the time. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Hall. We really appreciate your presentation and the information that you shared with us today about opiates and methamphetamine in southeastern Florida. And now 
We're going to move on to Texas, where Dr. Maxwell is going to share some data about current trends in her state and also is going to tell us a little bit about some changes in the production of methamphetamine and a potential relationship with HIV. So, Jane, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. And as with the other panelists, I'm a bearer of bad news. But let me show you briefly how we differ from the East Coast. And I think we've got some intertwined epidemics that I want to show you a little bit about. First, this is heroin in Texas. You can see there is something of an increase. And this is a logarithmic uh, graph where I'm just really trying to look at the overall uh, movement. Uh, the numbers are up. And this is methamphetamine. You can, in comparison, look at how much higher they are in 2015 as compared to heroin. If you look at the vertical red bars, that is 2008, which is really where the impact of the pseudoephedrine limitation ban hits. And then right after that, we see the numbers taking off. And, varying somewhat as to how quickly they move. But there's no question meth is up higher than it has ever been. And importantly, much, much higher than it ever was when it was pseudoephedrine. I want to show a little bit about the quick history of meth uh, because it's changed. And most of us aren't really aware of the differences. In 1970 and 1980, we had the faint P2P phenylactone method used to make meth. Then it was scheduled in 1980 in Texas. It's still legal in Texas. And we saw in the US the meth was being made by pseudoephedrine. 2005 regulate pseudoephedrine and it was banned and it continues to be banned in Mexico. There was a big drop in the numbers in 2007 because a rogue importer of pseudoephedrine was arrested. He had been importing 55 gallon drums of pseudoephedrine and sending it up to the desert labs in California. We used to talk about the desert labs and the large amount of methamphetamine they were making. And once they took him out in 2007, the numbers changed. We then had the shift back, actually from pseudoephedrine, back to phenylpropanone again, the P2P. And there is a new alternative, a nitrostyrene version emerging. So basic point is take away one precursor and you get another. Also, the phenyl-2-propanone, the P2P, is not easy to make. It's not legal in the U.S., and it takes a really expert chemist to do it. It's not like Breaking Bad or in the bathtub in the motel. You've got to really know what you're doing. So people are less likely to produce it in the U.S. And then in Southeast Asia and Australia, they're still using pseudoephedrine. We have a little bit coming in occasionally that DEA sees is from there, but the bulk of ours is a P2P recipe. And here is the picture of the basement of the guy who was importing and then moving all that pseudoephedrine up into California. Those are all one uh, US dollars. And here is the method of production, you can see over time the pseudoephedrine has continued to really drop and the phenyl 2 propanone, the P2P, is up. There is still some pseudoephedrine being made, particularly in the small labs up in Indiana and Illinois. The numbers of labs being registered or are being taken down by the government are continuing to drop. But this may be still small-time pseudoephedrine being cooked at home uh, for friends or family, but you can't get enough of it to really make a lot of money. But look, notice the increase in P2P. And then there's a concept of purity versus potency. How pure is it? Has it got dirt in it? Has it got other stuff in it? 
And then potency, which most of us never think about. How strong is it in terms of what it does to the brain? And we have two isomers in methamphetamine. The L isomer is the VIX uh, inhaler that cuts down the uh, swelling in your nose. The D isomer is three to five times stronger uh, on central nervous system act activity, much, much stronger than any form of methamphetamine we had seen before the P2P. And I think that's why we're beginning or hearing about more and more problem cases and people becoming dependent and psychotic very quickly because it is so much stronger. And basically, if it's 100% potent, it's all D form. If it's zero potent, it's all L form. And here's what it looks like now, according to the DEA meth profiling program. We're up to about 98% purity and about 97% potency. So meth is pure and more worrisome, far more potent than what we've ever seen before. So if we talked about people doing crazy things on meth in 2010, imagine what we're going to see as we get into this more potent. In Texas, I'm hearing about areas that had been dominated by heroin are now reporting more problems with meth and new users becoming psychotic in shorter periods of time. Uh, my out, screen outreach worker is reporting more, more crystal meth use among young men having sex with men and high risk sex, heterosexual populations. Uh, sexually transmitted diseases are being spread through the use of Grindr and Craigslist, in which you can go online and with your app, I got meth, and hit the button, and magically people will come in right where you're standing and uh, help you use the meth. Fortunately, our outreach workers also have those apps, and they will also appear and offer condoms and HIV testing. But this has totally changed how we handle cases. Lastly, I want to point out meth can be brought into the U.S., dissolved in water. Once it gets in the U.S., it hits the dry houses and it's turned back to crystal meth. But don't worry, we don't have problems of people dissolving meth in water and giving it to kids to lure them into meth use. It would just kill them. This is a worrisome chart. This is testing in the general workforce. This is courtesy of the Office of Controls. The, it's from Quest Diagnostics, Quest Diagnostic, and it's from ONDCP. And you can see that the, it, the red, the Western cases predominate. But notice in the last couple of years, about as many people are testing positive for meth in the South as in the West. And I think we certainly know that it's a major problem in Atlanta, but I think we need to be prepared that this is gonna spread, that we're seeing more and more use of methamphetamine in areas which we hadn't previously seen them in. Another thing I looked at was sexually transmitted diseases. Early latent syphilis is being infected within the first year. So this is a case rate for men who have sex with men and being infected in that first year. And you can see how the numbers have really gone up between 2014 and 2015. Then the Texas Department of State Health Services has, people, has the physicians who diagnose syphilis uh, talk to them about how they met their partners. And this shows the increase in the use of Grindr and other phone applications between 2013 and 2014, from 23% to 39%. So what the outreach workers were reporting about the use of these apps is actually being confirmed by people who have gone syphilis in the last year. This looks at the number of men having sex with men with syphilis who use meth, and the proportion of meth users is gradually increasing in this one. 
And CDC has a survey in the major cities of the U.S. in which they target certain populations. Year one, they target heterosexuals who um, have gotten um, AIDS or HIV. Year two is injecting drug users, and year three is men who have sex with men. So we now have six years of data on a rolling average. And you can see the increase in non-injecting men who have sex with men who reported using meth uh, from 9% to 45% in six years. And then I looked at AIDS cases, which we traditionally do in our CEWG and uh, this program. And one of the things that bothered me, when we first started reporting it in 1987, 71% of the AIDS cases had been exposed by men having sex with men. 2014, it's back to 70%. We're back to where we were almost 30 years ago. And you look at the others, they're down. So I thought, well, maybe this 70% is because the denominator is much smaller, that we don't have as many cases. But unfortunately, we have in 2014-15, over 4,000 cases. We have more cases now than we had in 1987. So there's been no decrease in AIDS cases. And the demographics are worrisome because the blue are Hispanic males and that's the one population that is really increasing. Uh, the black male population is stable, uh, white males is down, but this poses some real problems in doing outreach and straight outreach and treatment. Uh, why aren't we seeing these Hispanic males in treatment yet? Or is it because they don't have insurance? So therefore, they're afraid to come to treatment. I don't know, but it worries me. My concerns with all of this, there is no FDA-approved medication to treat methamphetamine craving and dependence. NIDA is funding two big studies trying to discover vaccines or treatments that could treat methamphetamine craving, just like we have the new pills that can treat the problems with opiate dependence. Uh, there's the matrix model that's been around forever. It's a psychosocial model. It can increase treatment adherence, but it's not a cure. So we're talking about an epidemic with no cure. And there's no cure for AIDS. We do now have a pre-exposure prophylaxis that if you take it exactly as prescribed, can prevent HIV infection if you practice safe sex and use condoms during any kind of sex. But I think one of the problems is that a lot of these young men are not perhaps uh, totally compliant with the medication. So basically, looks like we have an intertwined epidemic with no cures. And with that, I've ruined your day. My apologies. Thank you, Jane. Actually, I can assure you we appreciate your presentation. And we're going to move on now to our final speaker, Dr. Philip Coffin, who is joining us from San Francisco to talk to us about his trends there. And so whenever you're ready, you can get started. All right, am I up? Yep, you're okay. up, it looks good. So, uh, so I'm gonna talk briefly about uh, some, some updates from, uh, from San Francisco. I, as disclosure information, I always give on all of my talks. Um, I run several clinical trials. I've received donated study medication from both Gilead and Alchemist in the past. Uh, we used a, a number of different data sources. I won't belabor this, but uh, uh, not all of these are, are in this specific talk. Um, the first thing I'll jump into is the methamphetamine data. I, I've put all the data or three data sources onto this one slide to really try to demonstrate that we've uh, since 2009, we've really had increasing issues with methamphetamine in San Francisco. Um, the dotted line up at the top shows the uh, number of methamphetamine treatment admissions in San Francisco, and that's been going up. Uh, 
essentially consistently. The dashed line is the number of methamphetamine related deaths, and that corresponds to the right axis, not the left axis. And that has been consistently going up since 2009. And then the solid line corresponds to the number of methamphetamine related hospitalizations at the county hospital in San Francisco. And that has also been going up. In interest to, to see what's going on here, one of the things I wanted to look at was if we had an aging cohort of methamphetamine users, but the age for these has been consistent. For example, the uh, age of methamphetamine deaths from 2005 through 2015, the median age has been between 48 and 49. So really no evidence that it's an aging cohort, but instead seems to be an increasing issue. Um, we are one of the sites that uh, Dr. Maxwell mentioned that the CDC conducts the National HIV Behavioral Surveillance Study in. And in our data from 2005 to 2014, we, among men who have sex with men, we actually had a substan substantial decrease in methamphetamine use. It seemed to be replaced by cocaine use. So that was very much in contrast to these findings, suggesting that there are different trends in different subpopulations within San Francisco. Moving on to opioids, our opioid data are, uh, we, we didn't see the increase in opioid related mortality that the rest of the country did. We, this is, we believe this is partly due, if you look at the dashed line, the large dashed line on the top that corresponds to the right axis. So we've had right around 110-ish uh, overdose deaths a year since 2005 at, from opioids. And the difference is that we've seen, we saw them transition to be from being almost all heroin to being almost all prescription opioids. Uh, and then a little bit of a decline, which we hope is real in 2015. We'll wait and see what the 2016 data show. Um, we have seen an increase in treatment admissions for opioids and all of our treatment admissions, almost all, over 95% over are for heroin. We don't really get treatment admissions. We haven't really gotten many, uh, just a handful for prescription opioids. So, um, so that's really driven by heroin. We have seen uh, from the, again, from the CDC National, National HIV Behavioral Surveillance data, we've had an increasing number of heroin injectors in San Francisco since 2005. So we have a larger population, and I suspect that the increased enrollment in treatment is related to population size. Um, the bottom line that's solid is the number of opioid-related hospitalizations, which declined until about 2011 and has slowly increased since then. Diving into this a little bit deeper on the opioids, we have had a naloxone program since 2003 in San Francisco where uh, we provide naloxone uh, distributed from low threshold service programs, largely needle exchanges, so largely targeting injection drug users rather than prescription opioid users. The uh, the lines here correspond to uh, the number of new enrollments in the, in, on the, the left side of each year, the refills in yellow, and then the reversals in blue. And as you can see, we've had an increasing number of, of enrollments, uh, refills, and reversals, particularly since uh, 2010 or 11, and then uh, some substantial jumps in 2014 and 15. This is a map of the uh, geolocated uh, reversals from naloxone for opioid overdose. And the black line represents districts that have a naloxone program, naloxone distribution site within them. So as you can see, most of the reversals, the, the lion's share are within, are near, near to uh, the sites where naloxone is distributed. And the darkest sites are in the Tenderloin, the South of Mission, the South of, south of south of market neighborhood and the mission district. So those are classically our, our heaviest uh, areas for, for drug use in San Francisco. This is a map of opioid overdose mortality. And as you can see, there still is a peak as we would expect in the uh, Tenderloin, south of market and mission districts of San Francisco. However, there's uh, more deaths than one would expect in the outlying areas of San Francisco, including uh, well-to-do uh, neighborhoods such as Pacific Heights. So there is, there seems to be sort of two, 
two populations that are suffering from opioid overdose mortality. One which is access, one which is in sort of traditional areas where there's a lot of drug use, and the other which is more in the outskirts of the city where uh, we're not really resourced or to, uh, to, to handle the issue. Of all of these deaths that are up here, only 9% involved heroin. And when we were able to access the primary care data, which we were able to do for about 50% of decedents, 80% of them had been uh, relatively recently prescribed opioids. So based on this information, uh, the city implemented a naloxone co-prescribing program in six safety net clinics in San Francisco where uh, all the patients who used opioids were, um, or mo most of them were offered naloxone. Um, to also give a slightly different perspective on the uh, prescription opioid issues in San Francisco, we looked at the prescription drug monitoring program aggregate data. We ha only had that through 2013. But as you can see, compared to the surrounding counties, San Francisco has a declining number of opioid prescriptions since 2010. So uh, we are prescribing fewer opioids in the city than we used to, and we're having a more substantial reduction than the surrounding counties. So one of the things we wanted to do was try to get a sense of uh, what happened with the reduction in uh, heroin overdose deaths and the increase in prescription opioid overdose deaths. Because what we saw in the actual numbers was something approaching a, a 80 to 90% reduction in heroin overdose deaths which I didn't believe was possible with any interventions in San Francisco. So uh, I, my suspicion was that we were seeing uh, some reduction among people who were using heroin, some reduction in overdose mortality, but that we were also seeing a transition of some people who injected heroin to uh, injecting prescription opiates instead due to the increased availability of prescription opiates in the first decade of the new millennium. So we looked at medical examiner records and actually dug through the uh, narratives of the records to try to tease out, to identify any evidence whatsoever of, in, of the possible heroin involved in the overdose or of any injection drug use. So the yellow line represents the uh, number of deaths each year among uh, people who may have used heroin related to their overdose or had any evidence of injection drug use. And as you can see, that decreases by about 30 to 40% from 2006 to 2012. At the same time, the number of deaths uh, involving, that don't involve heroin and don't involve any evidence of injection drug use, so sort of that other population I was alluding to is represented by the green line. And that increased overall during the time period, although uh, it really peaked in 2009 or 10. In the co-prescribing program where we tried to reach the, that other population who weren't necessarily uh, weren't injecting heroin or injecting prescription opiates, but were using prescription opiates that we felt were at risk for uh, overdose, but weren't being reached through our naloxone program. Um, we implemented the naloxone co-prescribing program and we successfully prescribed naloxone to 40% of uh, patients who were on long-term opioids. And for those who are on long-term opioids, represented by the blue line, there was a substantial reduction in opioid-related emergency department visits compared to those who uh, were not prescribed naloxone. We also wanted to look and see if the uh, prescribing naloxone, how that uh, affected patients and affected their relationship with their opioids. And uh, we identified that the, uh, those who were prescribed naloxone were uh, about a third of them reported being more cautious about their opioid use and uh, other reduced potential opioid overdose risk behaviors. And um, we didn't see any change, any behavior changes that could be construed as negative with regard to opioid use. Um, when we interviewed these patients, the, about over a third of them reported a history of overdose, although half of them did not report it as an overdose, which raises the problem with the terminology. So about half the people who had had an overdose by uh, our determination uh, denied an overdose but reported a bad reaction where they uh, stopped breathing or couldn't be woken up without medical assistance from their opioids. And they all felt that they were at a very low risk for overdose, which is not consistent with our knowledge, which is that an overdose 
puts you at very high risk of a future overdose. Um, to give an example of one of these patients, one of these participants, this subject uh, had uh, never used illicit drugs and took his medications exactly as prescribed. And the interviewer asked him uh, how many times these bouts of delirium or stopped breathing because of opioids had occurred. He said eight to 10 times. How many times has naloxone been used on you? That would be hard to answer in the neighborhood of 12 to 15 times. So around 12 to 15 times someone gave you naloxone because you stopped breathing because of opioids. Yes, medical staff each time. Over what period of time? Over one year. So uh, this is an example of somebody who suffered the negative consequences, adverse reactions to opioids that we would call an overdose, but did not identify it as an overdose, raising serious concerns with the terminology. Um, another role that naloxone served in San Francisco um, given in this chart. So the yellow bars correspond to the left axis and they're the number of lay naloxone reversals reported to our distribution program. The red bars represent the number of fentanyl related opioid overdose deaths. And generally we have three or four of these a year in San Francisco. We have not had much fentanyl in San Francisco. It's been limited to a couple of outbreaks. The first outbreak occurred June through August of 2015 and that was fentanyl powder being sold as heroin but a, a white powder is readily distinguishable from the black tar heroin traditionally sold in San Francisco. So people on the street could tell that it was something different. Uh, we learned about this outbreak of fent this uh, sale of fentanyl in the city by the naloxone program, which reported a dramatic increase in naloxone reversals during the summer of 2015. Um, we, uh, we responded to that with health alerts and uh, harm reduction programs responded to that by, by reaching out to their clients. And there, were, uh, there was no increase in deaths, only one fentanyl death the entire summer uh, related to that outbreak, but a, a huge number of, increased number of or, overdoses. So uh, we felt that that was a successful uh, example of how a, a naloxone program like this can serve to as an early warning system and potentially avert the fatalities that would normally uh, in an outbreak like this would normally be detected first by the medical examiner. Uh, a couple of months later, we had fentanyl being stamped as counterfeit Xanax, similar to what has been seen in Florida. Uh, this is easily done. The Xanax stamp can be purchased for $150 off of eBay. So it's very easy to, to stamp things into counterfeit pills at this stage. Um, we had no increase in naloxone reversals. The Xanax being sold is in San Francisco is generally being purchased by a different population, a population of people, for example, that uh, party on Saturday night and want to get some rest on Sunday, so they take a Xanax to sleep during the day. Uh, they're not looking to use opioids. They're, uh, they're maybe using other drugs, but um, they don't uh, identify as an opiate user and they're not uh, connected to the resources that an opiate user would be connected to. So we had no increase in naloxone reversals and we had uh, eight associated deaths. So uh, that unfortunately um, missed our, our early warning system. So in summary, uh, we've seen a really substantial increase in meth methamphetamine related morbidity and mortality in San Francisco. Our opioid use has, shift has been shifting from prescription opioids back towards heroin, it seems. Uh, the uh, San Francisco has really encountered limited fentanyl outbreaks. We have been uh, saved from that largely. And those affecting the injectors have been detected by the naloxone pro program so far. Um, the naloxone distribution at harm reduction programs may have reduced mortality among injectors in San Francisco, uh, we suspect, but it didn't reach beyond the injector community to the uh, broader community of people using opioids yet. Uh, we'll have future data on that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Coffin, and thank you very much to all of our panelists today in the webinar. We really appreciate all of your presentations. And before we go on to the Q&A part of our webinar, I just wanted to give a shout out to our SEs who were not presenting today, but who are incredibly valuable to end use as well and whose reports we have truly appreciated in all of your hard work and so we have dr denise paone in new york dr suet lim in philadelphia 
Dr. Brian Dew in Atlanta Metro, Dr. Lawrence Owlette in Chicago Metro, Dr. Cynthia Arpkin in Wayne County, Detroit area, Dr. Cindy Loeb in Denver Metro area, Dr. Caleb Bantagreen in King County, Seattle area, and Dr. Mary Lynn Brecht in Los Angeles County. So I hope that some of you are, are actually participating in the webinar today. And all of you who are participating, I want to once again encourage you, if you haven't done so already, to join the Unused Network, where you can participate in ongoing conversations about topics like this. And I also want to let you all know that our next scheduled webinar will feature Drs. Caleb Bantagreen and Dan Burgard. It will be held on November 16th at 2 p.m. EST, and they will be presenting on recent results from their research on wastewater testing. So I hope that you all will be able to join us then. And I'm only going to take a few more minutes of your time and just check in and see if we've had any questions come in. We did have several questions come in during the presentations that we answered as we went along, but we have one remaining question that I'll put out to our panelists. So any of you who wants to pitch in with an answer, please remember to unmute yourselves before you speak up. And so this is a question from a viewer who wanted to know where the information that fentanyl is directly coming from China and Mexico is coming from, or I guess maybe they wanted more information about that. I believe most of this uh, information is coming from federal law enforcement sources like the DEA. Um, and we, we don't uh, generate those data ourselves uh, in Maine, for example. All right, thank you. In South Florida, we also have uh, reports from Homeland Security and US Customs uh, that most of the packages containing these substances originate from China and are uh, coming through worldwide delivery systems. Okay, thank you, that was very helpful. That's the we're, just, just, one, just one other thought, um, as the previous webinar on NDUS uh, by Dr. Matthew Young showed, uh, also there has been a, uh, a link uh, uh, through Canada as not the source of the analogs, but as a transshipment point uh, arriving usually first on the West Coast in Vancouver area, Canada, uh, then moving across Canada and from there uh, coming into the United States. Okay, thank you, appreciate that information. If I see no other questions, which I'm, I'm not seeing at this point. Oh, here comes one question now. Uh, this question is regarding the dramatic rise in synthetic overdoses, what role does direct internet sales to end users play in this? Any, any of you have anything you wanna pitch in on that one? I can comment and say that it's very difficult to track. And uh, so I don't have any direct data on it, except that we find it occasionally in particular cases. It appears that most of the internet trafficking we are seeing is not to end user, but to a mid-level dealer, generally in at least a kilogram quantity or more. Okay, thank you. And the other, only other item I'm seeing here is a comment from a viewer who appreciated all of your valuable presentations. So thank you again for that. And since I see no other questions, I just have one other favor to ask of all of you who've been participating, and that is if you would take a couple minutes to participate in a poll for us before you leave the call, we would really appreciate your feedback and your opinions on what we should address in future webinars. So I'm gonna launch the poll now. And if you'll just take a minute to plug in your answers, we'd really appreciate it. I launched it, but I don't, there we go.
All right, looks like the number of participants in the poll is starting to slow down. So I'll just say thank you again, everyone, for joining us today for this webinar. And we certainly hope you will join us again in the future. And we look forward to talking with you then. Oh, did I just see another question pop up? All right. Well, I would say it looks like just about everyone has participated in the poll. All right. So I think that will be it for today. Thank you, everyone.